Hey, good day. This is another topic in our gynecologic module. Today, we will talk about vulvar and vaginal tumors. Once again, I am Dr. Armero, and this will be our second topic. So these are the objectives listed to list factors for vulvar risk factors for vulvar neoplasms. At the end of the session, you should be able to enumerate symptoms and the physical examination findings of a patient with vulvar and vaginal neoplasms. And likewise, list the indications for vulvar biopsy. So let's start with the vulva. Of course, for us to be able to understand the pathologies with it, we should go first to the anatomy. So vulva, also called the pudenda, these are the structures visible externally from the symphysis pubis to the perineal body. And these are those structures. There are a lot of them. And the lining epithelium, very basic. You should remember that it is lined by a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So as you see here in the illustration on the side, you should be able to appreciate the entire podenda or the entire vulva. Again, it starts from the symphysis pubis and ends in the perineal body. Okay, that's the perineal body. All right. So also very important for you to remember is the vulvar lymphatics. Why are these important? Because of course the the lymph the lymph drains uh, depending on the direction of the vulvar lymphatics. So as you can see here, um, to see and beyond the midline, okay, here, to see and beyond the midline, you'll be able to note that it drains at the superficial nodes first, so in the inguinofemoral lymph nodes. And so for vulvar malignancies, the ilio uh, inguinal lymph nodes are the first nodes that gets affected. So there's what we call the node of Cloquet. It's the most proximal or highest node named after Jules Germain Cloquet. He is a French surgeon in, with an interest in urnial disorders. The node is located just inferior to the inguinal ligament and may also be considered the most inferior external iliac chain node. Th th that is just good to know. All right, this is the, the one I mentioned, the midline place. The significance of the midline is very important. So as I mentioned, if it crosses at the mons, then, and the posterior forche, uh, it can cross over to both sides. However, but it's if it's farther, it drains from the ipsilateral side only. So that's the significance of the flow of the lymphatics in the vulva. Okay, uh, as part of the objectives, we should be able to identify risk factors. So very important, HPV infection. This comprise 70% of the cases. Uh, lesions can be warty or basaloid, and this can lead to a premalignant condition called the vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia. neoplasia. Usually not keratinized, so there are no keratin in these uh, changes. And another risk factors, a risk factor is a granulomatous disease of the vulva, presence of diabetes in the patient, hypertension in the patient, smoking, obesity, prior treatment with stratified squamous carcinoma of the cervix or the vagina. So these are genital organs very close to the uh, vulva. So age, again, is a very important risk factor. If a patient is over 50 years old, usually um, the pathology we find is the squamous cell carcinoma. But for younger patients, it can be, say, around 40 to 55, it's carcinoma in situ. While younger patients are at risk for premalignant lesions due to history of sexual propensity. Also, the immune system plays a very significant role. If the patient is immune suppressed, then 
instead of the most common age group that uh, develops squamous cell carcinoma is over 50 for immune suppressed patients, it can occur even, even among below 40 years old. So I have a question here. What HPV serotype is predominantly associated with vulvar carcinoma? So we are aware that the human papilloma virus has several serotypes. So here, is it HPV6, HPV11, 16, or 61? So kindly uh, try to answer. And let's see on the subsequent slide if your answer is correct. So the answer is HPV16. I hope you got it correctly. There is a 35-fold increase among patients with history of genital warts. So that means, again, among the risk factors, genital warts is caused by human papilloma virus. So genital warts is caused by a benign a serologic type of um, low-risk type of the human papilloma virus. So we move on to vulvar atypias. So these conditions present with very common general irritation, itching, whitish change. Um, this whitish change is brought about by the thickening of the keratin layer. Again, the vulva is lined by a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And so if there's thickening of the keratin layer, it presents as a whitish change or it can be red or pigmented in case of um, vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia. It can be a reddish nodule in case of a pagets or a carcinoma in situ. It can also be eczematous for pagets. Ulceration can also be a presentation of an atypia. However, again, we cannot diagnose these conditions merely by their appearance. Myopsy is necessary for us to be able to differentiate what pathology we are dealing with. So first is the lichen sclerosis. This is a chronic, progressive, inflammatory skin condition. This, this has a pre-malignant potential, especially or more commonly at the clitoris. Now, it is whitish, thickened, excoriated, edematous, and there can be cases whereby the labia minora is resorbed. So as you can see here, there's just, we cannot anymore identify, see? We cannot anymore identify the, the labia. What we can see here is just the clitoris, okay? It's buried, okay? Now, in the disease, as the disease progresses, the skin loses pigmentation and becomes very thin and wrinkled. We call this as the cigarette paper appearance. Okay. All right. So histologically or microscopically, we have two sections we see in this slide. This is the normal um, keratinized stratified squamous epithelium with skin appendages. While in lichen sclerosis, you will be able to appreciate the thinning of the epithelium. You see, it's thinned out, okay? Unlike here, no? We see it, it's, up. it's quite thick in some areas. There, okay, here it's thinned out, all right? Okay, and also there is blunting of the rit ridges. So what are the rit ridges? These are the rit ridges here, this one, okay? The, the shaggy part. Okay, we don't see any shaggy parts here anymore. Okay, so that's the microscopic appearance of lichen sclerosis. And also, as I said earlier, there is whitening because of the increase in keratinization or in presence of keratinization. Keratin layer is here. And you see that in this slide, the keratin layer is very thick. Okay, so that's again, lichen sclerosis blunting of the red ridges, there is thinning of the epithelium, and there is hyperkeratosis. How about squamous hyperplasia, or formally called the hyperplastic dystrophy, or the lichen simplicus chronicus? So those are the, the names, as, um, the same as squamous hyperplasia. So grossly, again, generally looks white, but it can be raised or reddish. Here you go, that's squamous hyperplasia grossly. 
And microscopically, there is a thickened acellular layer of surface keratin with deepened and broadened red ridges. We call this acanthosis. So unlike lichen sclerosis, if there's blunting of the ridges, you will see that instead of the, the steep, shaggy appearance of the red ridges, the red ridges are broad. Here you see, it's broad. The, the, the normal is, it's steep like that, okay? These are broad red ridges, okay? So that is squamous hyperplasia. So again, this is the normal, oh, you see? And here there is broadening. And there is also thickening of the layer of surface keratin here. Okay. All right, next. Okay, atypical changes. If we, if we identify atypical changes, there is number one, loss of the maturation process. Of course, as the uh, layer uh, goes or goes up, maturation also increases. So there are nucleus present at the lower portion and loss of the nuclei at the upper parts. Ah, here. As you can see, this is the normal maturation process. And okay. other atypical changes include increase in mitotic activity and increase in nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Okay, so as you can see here, there are perinuclear halos that you can appreciate because of the effect of the human papilloma virus. So for VIN1, there is loss of the maturation process in less than one third, okay? However, if it includes already two thirds, you see here, there is an increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. That's VIN2, more than two thirds, but still within the basement membrane. Call it VIN3 or carcinoma in situ. However, if it goes beyond the basement membrane, then that's already the invasive carcinoma. Okay, so this is in high power view. Here you will appreciate the mitotic activities here. In arrows here, mitotic activities. There, all right. Okay, how about Paget's disease? The very important in Paget's disease is a part that it's a rare intraepithelial disorder. Uh, the histology resembles the Paget disease in the breast. It has Paget cells. These are pale, large cells that occur in nests and infiltrate upward in the epithelium. So here, these are Paget cells here. This, okay. There are also abnormalities of the apocrine glands of the skin. Now, the clinical implication here is that the Paget's disease of the vulva has increased association with underlying adenocarcinoma of the vagina, anus, bladder, cervix, colon, stomach, and breast. And this tends to spread often in an occult fashion and recurrences are frequent after treatment. Okay, treatment. Like in, like in sclerosis, topical steroids, calcium urine inhibitors like tacrolimus, primicrolimus. These are non-steroidal. Okay? We can also give hormonal creams uh, such as testosterone, but there are issues on um, virilization. Repair of the perineum, such as the one that happens whereby there, we lose the labia minora. Hmm? The clitoris is being buried. While for uh, vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia, we can give the 5 fluorouracil to treat cancer in situ. While Paget disease, wide excision uh, biopsy, okay, wide excision biopsy, or we give the imikimod cream. Now, question Do we biopsy all lesions in the vulva? It's just a yes or no answer. Okay. Here are the indications for biopsy. So we do not left and right do biopsy apart from the expenses. No? However, again, we look at the risk factors of the patient and look at the indications for biopsy. Number one, the cause of the symptom is not obvious. Number two, initial empiric treatment fails. Usually this, is, this becomes a problem because women 
postmenopause uh, usually are embarrassed to go and have consultation. And when they do, it's quite late already. And the doctors um, usually uh, give them empiric treatment first. And then when it fails, it's the only time they refer to gynecologists. Okay. Um, if the mass has an exophytic hyper or hypopigmented lesion, ulcers, no, it's ulcerated, sample the edges, make sure you differentiate it from an STD that can cause ulcers. So I hope you remember what, what STD is that it presents with the ulcer. Uh, we can enumerate the syphilitic ulcer, uh, the ulcer caused by the hemophilus ducreae, the herpes simplex, those are ulcers. Okay, uh, what other... Okay, diagnostic methods. So how do we diagnose? Well, pap smear in the vulva is not proven helpful. Why? Because the keratin, no, the yeah, the keratin, the epithelium is very thick, unlike the vagina and the cervix, which shed off very frequently. The vulva, um, unless it's an ulcer, then we can do sampling and stain uh, and then we do a pap smear. Tolvidin blue test, um, those that uh, retain the blue areas will be biopsied. Colposcopy, we usually put a 3% acetic acid and those with white, the areas with white, will do a biopsy. Not used for routine vulvar examination, primarily, primary used for those who are being evaluated or followed for vulvar atypia. Um, we identify the discrete whitish or pigmented areas that warrant biopsy. Well, for biopsy, we can just do punch. So tsk, we bite when, with a keys dermal punch biopsy. Tsk, and then when it bleeds, we can just press the area or control it by applying silver nitrate or ferrous subsulfate or the Monsa solution. So those are for vulvar atypias. We move on to malignant conditions. Okay, vulvar cancer. Vulvar cancer comprises 4% of gynecologic malignancies. It ranks fourth. So what comes first? Endometrial, O, ovarian, C, cervix, then fourth, vulvar. Again, as I mentioned, the lining epithelium is a keratinized squamous uh, epithelium and so therefore it follows that the most common histologic type or 90% of it is squamous cell carcinoma and the second most common is the malignant melanoma. Vulva cancer since usually it's on the outside no, it's diagnosed at an early stage stage one and two um, mostly among older women unless immune compromised as I mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, in in uh, United States, there is good prognosis, hopefully here also, here in the Philippines. Uh, traditional treatment includes radical excision with lymph node dissection or sentinel node dissection. And for advanced disease, chemo radiation. So these are the stages of vulvar cancer. Now, on in the seventh edition, there is a quite... Um, there's a difference in the staging for the 7th and the 8th. So I'll just illustrate it with, uh, I'll just illustrate it here. So at least more or less, uh, you are familiar with how vulvar cancer is being staged. Again, in the objectives, um, it was not part, it, the, the staging, identification of staging was not part, but at least you know, okay? At least you know what stage 1 means, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4, all right? So we continue. So for stage one, the lesions are confined within the vulva. For stage two, the lesions are within the uh, perineal, near the perineal area, but beyond the vulva. So it includes the urethra, anus, and vagina. And for stage one and two, there are no nodes involved. While for stage three, uh, the cancer or the, yeah, the cancer has spread to the nearby lymph nodes. So when we say nearby lymph nodes, these are the superficial uh, lymph nodes. And the stage four has spread beyond, okay, the 
the area of the pelvis. So it uh, stage four also includes the um, uh, metastasis to other parts. Prognosis, when we talk about prognosis, of course, we consider the stage. The presence or absence of nodal involvement is very important. Of course, we look into the tumor grade. Is it fixed, ulcerated, lymph node? So if it's fixed or ulcerated, then that the involvement, there is suspicious involvement of the lymph nodes. There is lymphovascular space invasion, uh, especially among older women also. And if the tumor is thick, then most likely there is nodal involvement. Again, size of the lesion. The size of the lesion is very important. Also, um, the diameter and the location. So as I said, depending on its location, if it's within the 2CM from the midline, then there is crossing over of the lymphatics. So if it's farther, then usually it just involves the ipsilateral lymphatics. So here, here you go. Uh, surgery, as I said, wide local excision or radical vulvectomy and involvement of the inguinofemoral uh, lymph node. We remove it. Okay. So for a mass within the, the 2CM margin, so as you can see, we remove both, no? Bilateral. But here, for more than 2CM distance, oops, more, more than 2CM distance, um, the ipsilateral side only. How about other vulvar malignancies? So these there are um, six of them that uh, we will be able to touch one by one. Okay. Bartholin gland carcinoma. So this is an adenocarcinoma. So this is a carcinoma of glandular origin, not any more squamous. Well, we see this as an enlargement of the Bartholin glands in a postmenopausal women. So I hope that you still remember the location of the Bartholin glands. It's around four to six o'clock location at the vestibule. Okay. So vul radical vulvectomy with bilateral inguinofemoral lymph adenectomy will be the therapy. While basal cell carcinoma, it's rare, around 2%. Uh, it usually presents as an ulcerated lesion. However, wide local excision is enough. No? Now, if we look at the margins and it is free of tumor, of the tumor, then it's considered cured. While the virocos carcinoma, this is a rare variant of the squamous cell carcinoma. So virocos, no? you're familiar with virocos. Um, it appears like a condylomatous mass, like cauliflower. Um, microscopically, we appreciate mature, mature squamous cells with extensive keratinization with nests uh, that invade the underlying vulvar tissue. The diagnosis should be from multiple biopsies. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, the lesion is biopsied adequately for us to be able to truly diagnose virucose carcinoma. So therapy is wide excision. Um, radiation is ineffective, so it's contraindicated because it worsens the prognosis. Radical vulvectomy or inguinal no dissection is also not indicated. However, local excision is inadequate. It should be wide excision. Now, if this occurs with squamous cell carcinoma, then this can metastasize to regional lymph nodes. So it's not anymore virucose carcinoma, but it has squamous cell carcinoma. So management is different. How about melanoma, malignant melanoma? Most common non-squamous cell malignancy of the vulva, it usually arises from the junctional or compound nevi, uh, then it's excised. This occurs around 50 years old in average. This can be pigmented brown, black, blue, black. It can be flat or ulcerated, occasionally nodular. Uh, with the satellite nodules, these are the darkly pigmented areas surrounding the primary lesion. This may also resemble squamous cell carcinoma in gross appearance. Most common area uh, involved with melanoma is the labia minora and clitoris. If the thickness of the melanoma is 
uh, less than 0.7 millimeters. So again, the, the cutoff is this. Spread to lymph node is less likely. So here, um, I'm, I'm showing you the uh, depth of invasion, the superficial spreading of the melanoma and the nodular melanoma. So depending on the depth, as you can see here, the nodular has poorer prognosis, no? so deeper invasion. So as I said here in this slide, if it, the thickness is less than 0.76 millimeters, then spread to the lymph nodes is less likely. So here, less than 7.6 around this area. Okay, there. Oh, by the way, um, this is at the clitoris. As you can see, it's a melanoma here. Okay, therapy, wide excision and lymph node mapping or sentinel lymph node biopsy. Again, again, if the thickness is less than 0.76, a 2 cm margin will be enough. However, for a more advanced melanoma, a 2 to 3 cm margin should be done with lymph node dissection. However, the prognosis is poorer for a thicker melanoma of more than or equal to 3 millimeters. How about sarcoma? It's extremely rare. So it can be a leiomyosarcoma, which is the most common histologic subtype. It can be a liposarcoma, neurofibrosarcoma, angiosarcoma, epithelioid sarcoma, and the therapy is surgical removal, although chemotherapy is also considered. Granular cell myoblastoma, also extremely rare, invariably benign, but shows pleomorphism. It can be solitary, firm, non-tender, slow-growing nodule in the subcutaneous tissue. So what do we do? Local excision will do. So we're done with the vulva. We go deeper, vaginal tumors. So where is the vagina? Here. So outside is the vulva. So when we go inner, so in the vestibule, there's a vaginal canal. And as you go in, this is the vagina. So microscopically, we get a sample here and we enlarge at the side. It's still stratified squamous epithelium, but no more keratinization. Huh? Imagine a vagina with keratin. So it should have no keratin. huh? Remember, that's basic histology. So vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia. Uh, it's similar to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or uh, vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia. Uh, there is a tip yeah, depending on the levels of, of um, immaturity. If less than one third, one, two thirds, two, more than two thirds is three. And there is no breakage of the basement membrane. A basement membrane is intact, so there is no invasion. Usually occurs at the upper half of the vagina. So going back to the anatomy, the vagina is quite a long tube. Okay, these are the fornices here. And the lesions occur usually close to the cervix or the, the upper vagina. Now, risk factors include previous treatment for squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva, HPV infection, HIV infection, smoking, previous radiation therapy of the genital tract, and immunosuppressive therapy. So if uh, these are present, then the likelihood of a rare vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia can occur. Excuse me. If it's just vein one, we can observe surveillance, no? close surveillance. However, it's two or and three, we can opt for CO2 laser vaporization, 5-fluorouracil cream, we can, which can be self-administered. We can also do wide local excision. The wide local excision is the treatment of choice for vein three. So that's for atypia. How about for the primary cancer of the vagina? Now, the vagina is, the malignancy of the vagina is rare, um, less than 2% of the time. And 
if there is any cancer of the vagina, it's usually a metastatic condition already. It's not really a primary cancer of the vagina. Um, if it's metastatic, it comes from other parts, um, vulva, cervix, endometrium, ovary there. So the most common symptom is abnormal discharge or vaginal bleeding. If a patient complains of pain, then most likely the cancer of the vagina is already at an advanced stage. So the diagnosis, of course, direct biopsy. Again, since the lining epithelium of the vagina is a squamous, stratified squamous <clears throat> epithelium, then it's also the most common histologic type, stratified squamous carcinoma. This is common among women more than 60 years old, and the treatment involves radiation plus a chemotherapeutic agency's platin-based chemo treatment. So apart from the squamous cell carcinoma, which comprise um, majority okay, of the histologic types, it's been summarized here at the bottom, there are other tumor types, the <clears throat> yolk sac tumor, sarcoma botyroides, clear cell adenocarcinoma, and the melanoma. And the ages that these lesions <clears throat> are involved. So, okay, we'll go through them one by one. No? We'll touch. So, again, it's not in the objective, but it's very good for you at your level, no? third year students, that you know the staging of vaginal tumors. Now, uh, if it's within the vagina, again, stage one, it's large, uh, a little beyond the vagina, can involve the uterus, but not yet the pelvic side walls. This is not involved, okay? Still two. If there is already involvement of the pelvic side walls, then it's stage three. If in if there is more distant metastasis, such as the rectum, bladder, and for their other organs, then that's stage four. Also, the lymphatics is very important because the vagina is a long tube. If, if we say it's a long tube, depending on the location of the tumor, will the involvement of the lymph node be? So if it's in the upper portion, the closer will be the deeper lymph nodes. No? So we involve the obturator lymph node, the external and internal iliac lymph nodes. However, if it's at the lower part, okay, closer to the vulva, again, what's the lymph node as, um, involved in vulvar malignancies? Diba? It's the ing inguinal lymph nodes. So if it's in the lower part of the vagina, then it also involves the inguinal lymph nodes. All right, so from squamous cell carcinoma, we move on to the clear cell adenocarcinoma. It locally spreads via the lymphatics and blood vessels. And uh, therapy is radical hysterectomy with partial or complete vaginectomy, pelvic lymphadenectomy, and reconstruction. Although local excision with nodal dissection and radiation can be an option, especially for those who want to preserve the vagina, among lesions less than two centimeters in size and a predominantly tubulocystic pattern and the depth of the clear cell adenocarcinoma is less than three millimeters. So here, no? predominant age more than 14 years old. Again, remember DES exposure, diethyl silvestrol exposure of the patient intrauterine. So that means the mother of that patient was exposed with diethyl silvestrol while she is carrying the baby. Okay? Now, malignant melanoma, like the vulva, it's fatal and aggressive. It presents as bleeding, discharge, and palpable pigmented mass. Older patients, 57 years old above, early metastasis in the lymphatics and the blood vessels, wide excision, radiation, chemo treatment, immune treatment. Mm. Here, it's emphasized. Poor survival. Mm. It's not in a stable, but it was mentioned in the 8th edition of Compre Gynecology that the malignant adenocarcinoma arising from the endometriotic implants. So the endometriotic implant can implant anywhere. 
outside the endometrium. That's why it's called endometriosis. And there can be an associated adenocarcinoma that comes with it. And usually it presents with pain, bleeding, vaginal mass in patients with prior surgery due to endometriosis. So when you ask about surgical history, she had prior history due to endometriosis. Um, these patients had um, perhaps endometrioma, adhesions. No? So you ask that. The risk factor is unopposed estrogen and tamoxifen use. Thus, these endometriotic implants are very responsive to hormones. And so with unopposed estrogen, conditions among patients like obesity, uh, it becomes a risk factor. And the most common histologic type, because again, the lining of the endometrium is an endometrioid uh, lining. So endometrioid type is the most common histologic um, type of the malignant adenocarcinoma arising from the endometriosis. Now, we do surgery with chemo radiation. How about the endodermal sinus tumor uh, or the yolk sac tumor? As you can see here, it's among very, very, very young patients, no? less than two years old. Unfortunately, it's extremely rare. And the tumor marker, so remember the tumor marker huh, of yolk sac, alpha fetoprotein. Yolk sac, what's the pathognomonic? Yolk sac, Schiller Duval. Okay. Treatment or therapy, surgery with radiation. Although there are researches that. Um, make use of the VAC and the BEP chemotherapies. How about sarcoma but thyroiditis? So we also call it the embryonal rhabdosarcoma. So this is also younger patients as a nine years old here, here, here. Um, eight years old and less aggressive malignancy, multimodality on the therapy. So um, these children, suffer from abnormal bleeding with clusters of grapes forming polypoid masses. So it's again, multimodal therapy, chemo, surgery, and radiation are also used. So there you go. So that's the end of the vulvar and vaginal malignancies. Thank you.